Welcome to the Opportunity Podcast, where entrepreneurs come to learn from real buyers, sellers, and industry experts on the lesser known growth opportunities to build their online business empires. We'll uncover tactics veteran online business entrepreneurs have used to build, buy, flip, and sell their way towards personal wealth. Sit back, grab a coffee, and get ready to uncover hidden growth secrets. The Opportunity Podcast starts now. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast, your go-to resource for hidden growth opportunities throughout online business. For those familiar new to the podcast, I'm Sarah and thanks for joining me today. In this episode, we have Alexis Grant, the founder of They Got Acquired, an emerging media brand covering exits from $100,000 to $50 million. By sharing the stories of bootstrappers, underrepresented founders, and small but meaningful exits, They Got Acquired aims to redefine startup success. Alexis joins us to share her journey as a founder who navigated her own exits alone and why that inspired her to share stories and lessons learned around the M&A space. We discuss some of the toughest obstacles she faced while creating a media brand from scratch and the important insights she's learned from the stories that she shared. As an ex-journalist and experienced content creator, Alexis discusses the important role that storytelling and high-quality content play in the success of an online business and reveals where many entrepreneurs go wrong when trying to build out content for their sites. I don't want to give away too much just yet, so let's dig in the interview and see what Alexis has to share. Let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast. I am really excited to be joined by today's guest. We have Alexis Grant on the show. Alexis, how are you doing? Good. I'm excited about this. Yeah, I'm super pumped to have you here. We'll get all into some of your exciting stuff. I am curious, like, where are you calling in from in the world right now? I live in West Virginia, about an hour outside of Washington, D.C. Awesome. I didn't realize you were so close to D.C. I'm from two hours south of D.C., so we are now... Same place then, same area. You're like, we're getting closer and closer. The more guests I get on the show near Virginia and everyone hears about it, the more excited I get. So (laughs) (laughs) this is awesome. Well, cool. So got such an interesting backstory and I'd love to be able to share it with our audience. So for those who don't know you, walk me through your entrepreneurial journey and where you've kind of landed today. Sure. Well, I'll start with today, then I can work backwards. But right now I'm running a media company called They Got Acquired. It's at theygotacquired.com and we just launched five weeks ago. So we're pretty new in the space. We're covering acquisitions of online businesses that are smaller than the ones that you typically read about in the bigger publications. So any deals between 100,000 and 50 million, and it's all online businesses. And this is my fourth media company that I've built. So it's been quite a ride and it's really fun to kind of put some of the things I've learned over my career into practice for this particular niche. I started my career in journalism. I was a reporter at a couple of mainstream outlets, including the Houston Chronicle and the US News and World Report. And then I moved into starting my own business in 2009 was when I first started just figuring out that I actually liked working on my own. And, you know, I had kind of avoided business when I was in college. I just thought it was boring. I wasn't really interested in it. And when I started blogging and doing some freelancing online and selling my first few eBooks, I started to realize that business was actually really interesting and it gave me a lot of flexibility and autonomy and the potential to earn a lot more than I had earned in my journalism roles. So I got hooked And from there, I started with a social media agency or social media freelancing, really. And then I ended up turning that into a content marketing agency. We ran blogs for businesses. So this was in like 2011. And I did that for a few years until one of our clients, so one of the companies that we ran their blog, they ended up acquiring us. And this was a personal finance brand called The Penny Hoarder. And The Penny Hoarder bought my company through an aqua hire. So they brought myself and several members of my team in-house there to build out the content operation at the Penny Hoarder. And it was a great opportunity for me because I helped build a brand that was really much bigger than what I'd been doing on my own. So I was there for a few years and I left there about three years ago, partly because I wanted to move back to the DC area. That company was based in Florida. So we had moved to Florida for a couple of years. So my husband and I and our kids, we wanted to get back to the DC area. We now live outside of DC and West Virginia in a trail town. And I really wanted to get back to this area of the country and also 
back to running my own business because when the penny order purchased my company, I became an employee of that company. And there were so many great opportunities that I got you know, at that company. And I really enjoyed that ride, but I was ready to get back to running my own ship again. And so when I left there, I spent a little bit of time on a website that we can talk more about if you like, but it's called The Right Life, W-R-I-T-E. It was a website for writers that I had started a few years before. And so I picked that up when I left the penny hoarder and worked on that for about a year before I decided to sell that. So I went through selling that company. And part of the reason I wanted to get that off my plate was to make room for a new project. And I decided that new project would be They Got Acquired. So it was really inspired by my own experiences selling businesses. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because as you're talking about it, you know, all these questions started popping into my head. One in particular was like, I just found it really interesting when you're talking about being acquired by the penny hoarder that you had this model where you were absorbed by the penny hoarder and you signed on and you were then a part of that company. Like, I don't really see as many acquisitions happen. It's like you're with your company, but in a new iteration of itself. You know, I'm curious, like, why did you end up going that route? And, you know, did it feel like that was the right thing to do at the time? You weren't quite ready to step away from it totally and you wanted to be in it in a new chapter? Yeah, well, so in an aqua hire, usually the company that acquires the smaller company, they do so typically, not always, but usually for the team. And that was the case in my instance. So when we went in-house at the Penny Hoarder, we let all of our other clients go. So we weren't working on any of those other projects anymore that we have been doing as an agency. Instead, we were focusing entirely on building the Penny Hoarder's content operations. I was a second employee. The company was doing well, but it was still very small in terms of number of people. But the reason they wanted to do that was because we had been at that point running the content operation at the Penny Hoarder, like pumping out the content for about a year and a half. So we were able to take the processes and the team and also our broader network of freelancers that we'd relied on to create that content. We took it with us into the Penny Hoarder and that allowed us to just hit the ground running. So we could build out the content shop there much faster because we already had a lot of those processes in place. Yeah, no, I'm glad to give context around that because I'm just thinking definitely for a lot of the acquisitions I see on our marketplace, it's like we talk about that opportunity for sellers. Granted, it's usually a little bit of a different context. They're not always coming along with their whole team. It might be like a really strong founder that a bigger buyer sees and goes, you know, I really like what you've built. I think you're going to be the right person to help continue in this iteration or here's a performance earn out if you want to have some like continued part of this company. It's always good to walk through and see like what could be the different options for those thinking about, you know, selling out there. I guess on that note, because, you know, that was your first time getting acquired, but then you went through another sale. How did that second sale differ from, you know, the first time around? And what did you learn from that first instance that really kind of helped you in your second sale? Well, there are two different types of sales. So the first one, as I just explained, was an aqua hire, but the second one was an asset sale. So when I sold the website, I was able to transfer it to the new owner and I did not go along with that. So I was really giving them like what we'd built you know, I did include like all of our process documentation, but I didn't go along for that sale. It was much more of a handover and a transfer. So there were some differences in how the sales transpired, but I think there were also some learnings that I was able to apply from the first one to the second one. Mainly, I just kind of understood a little bit about how acquisitions worked and what the process might look like, which is always really daunting for a first-time seller because especially first-time sellers, sometimes we don't intend to sell our businesses. I certainly didn't the first time. So I had my head down really building that business. I never looked up and said, hey, you know, I should learn about how to get acquired because it wasn't really on my radar. And I think that's common for first-time sellers. So when you have the opportunity, you suddenly you have to learn a lot about it, <laughs> which is, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to start this new media brand, they got acquired to help people who are in that situation. So the second time, I still felt like I had a lot to learn. I won't say like, oh, I knew exactly what I was doing because it was a different type of situation. It was a different type of sale. And I had multiple bidders where I didn't have that in my first sale. So there was differences in the process to learn about. But in terms of what did I learn the first time that I applied the second time, I think one big learning was that whatever you're selling, well, I've written before about how like the multiples are 
a good guide, but aren't the be all end all when it comes to figuring out what your company can be worth. Sure. And the reason I say that is because I think sometimes it's possible to cap your own potential if you rely too much on a common multiple, where if you find the right company that wants to buy your business, it can be worth a lot more than that. So I kind of threw out like any formulaic (laughs) way of valuing a company the second time I sold. And I realized like, hey, look, this is worth as much as someone's willing to pay for it. And it's worth as much as I'm willing to part with it. And as long as we can find some common ground, that's how much this company is worth. And I just like threw out the whole idea of like, what is a multiple? (laughs) What's a common multiple for a content site? So I think that was one thing I learned is like, you can run up your valuation or how much your company can be worth if it's, you know, of a strategic value for the other party. In both of my sales, I kind of looked at like, hey, what is the other person going to get out of this? What is the other company going to get out of this? And how can I play that up to help increase the valuation? I have a question on my mind and I feel like maybe it won't land. Maybe it's not a fair question and that's okay. You can tell me if this is the case, but like, you know, going through two incredibly different transactions, did you ultimately feel like after, you know, one kind of ended up being your preferred method of exit or were they just too far different to even say, you know, one was better or one was not or, you know? Well, I got two totally different things out of them, right? Because in the first one, I was acquired by the Penny Hoarder in 2015 and I stayed there till 2019. So that was a chance to grow a startup from the ground. (laughs) You know, we grew it more than 100 employees and it's not quite that big anymore, but I got to go through the experience of scaling the company alongside the founder and the company was doing really well. So I got to access a lot of the resources that the company was generating to build the content team. I got a lot of practice in hiring and operations and just the early stuff that you have to learn with scaling a startup. So I got to learn all of those things after going through that first acquisition. And my second acquisition was really more of a, you know, hand over an asset and then try not to think about it because it was something I worked on for so many years. Right. So it's a totally different experience. But the second one was really satisfying in that I felt like done a good job of building something over time. You know, it, it gave a return for me and my family. And by selling it, I was able to clear my plate to work on something new, which was really my goal at that point. Yeah. No, I mean, I appreciate you answering that. I know it's hard to go. Yeah. I mean, you walked away with such different things, but interesting to see that you could really build a lot from both transactions. So obviously it has led you to where you are today, giving you the inspiration for they got acquired. So I wanted to dig into that a bit more. You know, I'm curious what need you identified in the online business community that ultimately inspired you to start sharing acquisition stories through they got acquired. I mean, did you see like just there was white space, like people weren't covering things properly or yeah, what led you to that? It really came from my own pain points as a founder who sold. And there was a couple of pain points. One was I didn't really know where to go to learn about the process. I didn't know how to find support professionals. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, M&A firms or lawyers and other financial professionals who will help you if you're making a huge sale, right? If you're selling for hundreds of millions of dollars. But if you're selling a company for six or seven figures, how do you find the professionals who are willing to help on that size of a sale? So I didn't really know how to find those people. I didn't know how to educate myself about the process. Like, where should I go on the internet to read about it, you know? And not only read about it, but where do I go to read about sales that are like mine? Like, I felt like there weren't a lot of examples of other people who were selling companies in the six and seven figure range. All the examples I saw were really big companies. A lot of them were VC backed. They were, you know, startups where the founders had worked themselves into the ground. I wasn't really into that lifestyle. So I wanted some examples of founders who had built their companies in the similar way that I did. And also like another piece of this is being a woman, right? There weren't that many examples of founders who looked like me. And so one thing I would have loved to have when I was selling both of my business was a place to get comps. So for example, like when you sell your house, you can look at what all of the other houses in your neighborhood have sold for to get a sense of what yours might sell for. And this kind of data exists for big companies when they're going for an acquisition, but it doesn't really exist for, well, it didn't until now because we're building it, <laughs> but for companies, you know, in low eight figure range. So that's one thing I personally would have had that's like, would have liked to have that's a really specific resource is I would have liked to be able to say, hey, show me 20 content companies that sold in the last two years for under $2 million <laughs> and just be able to look at a list of the metrics. And that's one of the things that we're building. 
Yeah. I mean, I think it's incredible what you've set out to do. And I can appreciate that you've lived it. You know, you're not somebody kind of on the outside going like, yeah, there seems to be no one's talking about this. So let's like dig in. It's like, you know, the pain points full well. And I think there's a lot you can accomplish with what you're trying to do. You know, you just touched on success a little bit and, you know, what you were seeing in the industry or maybe, so, you know, I say like larger M&A wasn't necessarily reflective of your vision of success. And so I'm curious to hear just a little bit more about, you know, your redefining startup success and what's the kind of definition of success that you would like to curate at They Got Acquired? Yeah, I think there's more than one way to build a startup. But if you look at a lot of the, you know, the culture around Silicon Valley and the articles that are coming out of some of these mainstream publications, the idea, the sense is that there's only one way to do it. You have to work yourself into the ground. You have to raise lots of venture capital. (laughs) I don't think that these things are all necessarily true. I mean, there are perks to building a startup in that way, but there are also other ways to go about it. So we're featuring companies that many of them are bootstrapped. Some of them have raised minimal funding. We don't really end up covering companies that have raised a lot of funding just because with a $50 million deal cap, typically a company that's raised a lot of venture money, they're going to have sold for more than that, or they need to sell for more than that to make their investors happy. Right. So between you know the bootstrapping or minimal funding angle, that's one piece of it. And then the other piece is kind of, how do you choose to build? Like, How are you choosing to put your company together? And there are lots of founders who bootstrap who work all the time, and you know they're putting their whole selves into it at every hour of the day. There's also other founders who are saying, hey, I also have a family, so maybe I'm only working 20 hours a week. And the truth is that it's possible to build something meaningful, even while working on an alternative schedule. And those are the kinds of things that we want to showcase is just people who are thinking a little bit differently and you know, outside the box about how do you build something meaningful. I really love that. And I really love that you come with that perspective. And I think it just brings more of a human element. I think what traditionally felt like a little bit out of reach and maybe a little bit out of touch, just watching, you know, a bunch of big VC backed guys in Silicon Valley do their thing. It's not the reflected reality of, you know, sometimes I've interviewed people on our marketplace. I've had I think one standout story to me was a woman who sold on our marketplace and she was like, yeah, you know, I was running my FBA business while I had, like I was breastfeeding my baby in the car, you know, while like, you know, just on the laptop at the same time doing my thing. And I was like, wow, how impressive for you to build all that. And you had just given birth to your second baby. And now you're looking to move on to your next step. And you did that all at the same time. Like that to me is just so impressive. I want to hear more about that. And that's what I love about what you're doing is it seems like you've really tapped into that and you're going, oh, there's just so many, I would call them normal people, (laughs) everyday Mm -hmm. people doing this and doing this Mm -hmm. successfully and making a lot of money. And Mm -hmm. people just don't even realize it's a thing, which is kind Mm -hmm. of, I guess you and I, we've probably been in this space long enough to like take it for granted that we know about it, but well, maybe not because you at one point didn't know about it, right? You had a business, but probably at some point weren't thinking about selling. Then it became a new reality. I just find that so interesting. Like, I just love that element about what you're doing. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, highlighting the acquisitions and the deals is one piece of it, but I think highlighting the opportunities, like what you can set out to build and how you can do it a little differently if you want to, you can make it fit your own lifestyle. I think just highlighting that is really important too. Yeah. I think it doesn't have to be the hustle culture. Mm -hmm. I want a megaphone when I say that. It doesn't have to be the hustle, everybody. Work doesn't have to be hard. So I would love to hear a little bit more on your journey just to build this brand. Because I think you've got one element of what you're doing. It's incredibly admirable that you've set out to gather these acquisition stories. But at the same time, it's like the second part of that is you're building an entire media brand and company from scratch which is a whole thing within itself. So I'm curious to hear more on that. Like what were your toughest obstacles you faced when you were trying to build this brand from the ground up? I mean, I'm still in it. We've only launched yeah. <laughs> weeks ago. So I think right now the biggest challenge I'm facing personally is toggling between the strategic part of the business and like, how do we grow this thing alongside with all of the execution that needs to happen. And this was a bit of a shift for me because- You know, obviously I've run my own business before, but when I was at the penny hoarder, I was in much more of a strategic role and I had dozens of people working on my team who could make the things happen that we talked about. And now I've gone back to a model where I have about 10 freelancers, so I'm not on my own and I have people doing the work, especially a lot of the reporting and the writing at the moment, but there's still a lot of pieces that I'm doing myself. And part of that, I actually really enjoy that. Like I love the really early phases of a startup where 
every little step forward is a win, you know, and you can really see the progress and everything you do can make a difference in growing the brand. So I really enjoy that. And I like getting my hands dirty with the details. And at the same time, I find it challenging sometimes to step back and say, wait a minute, what were my big picture things for this week? Because I got really in the weeds today. (laughs) Yeah. It's got to be hard to separate, you know, you're working in the business and on the business at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's just what you do, right? When you're a founder and it's the early days. It's got to be tough when you're probably like just in the weeds of doing something on your podcast. Maybe it was like a technical with your audio and all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, (laughs) I need to probably step back in this whole running the company thing. I'll get Mm -hmm. to that audio editing later. Yeah. I mean, during our launch, my laptop died and I got a new one and the new one didn't work properly. So I had to return that. I mean, it's having all these technical difficulties that it's easy to forget that when you are running your own business, especially in the early days, when you don't have a ton of staff, it's like all these things that have to get done that are really feel like they're not moving the business forward. They have to be done by me, you know? So figuring out what's my new laptop and then figuring out how to get it to work. Like all those things can feel annoying. They felt like it was slowing me down, but it's just part of the build. Yeah. Maybe I'm projecting a bit. I imagine that's got to be a lot of pressure, you know, all that on your shoulders. I don't know. It sounds like you have a little bit more of like a positive spin on it. I'm like nervous for you for some reason on the other side of the It doesn't make me feel nervous. (laughs) It's like, honestly, it makes me feel excited because there's so much opportunity. What I love about working on my own and, you know, some people have approached me about being a co-founder. I'm like, I never say never because I think there's a time and a place for everything. But what I love about doing my own thing and why I choose to be a solo founder is because then I'm not responsible for anyone else. Like I'm responsible to my team, but I'm setting the pace. And whenever I get stressed out, I try to remind myself that like, hey, you set this deadline. (laughs) No one else set it for you. Like move it, you know, or why does this have to be done so quickly? Might have to go a little slower. So I think it's really just about making sure my expectations are in check. I like to move fast. And that's not always possible when I'm not working 40 hours a week right now. I pick my kids up three days a week at 3 p.m. So like time is one piece of it, but it's also just like, there's a lot to do, you know? And so I think being really realistic about what can I actually do in a week? The only person putting the pressure on myself is me. Like I don't really feel pressure from anyone else. And this is one of the reasons why I like working for myself better than working for clients or having a co-founder is that's when I start to get feel anxiety is like when someone else is expecting something from me, because I'm the kind of person who I always like to deliver on time. I hold myself to really high standards. So it's better if it's only me setting those expectations and I don't have to deliver to someone else. Sure. No, I think there's a lot of beauty in that. I think everything that you just said is probably going to you know, echo through people's headphones and really just resonate because I think a lot of people see themselves in kind of the position that you're in now. It's why they ventured into entrepreneurship, right? It's like, I have a vision and I think I'm the best person to execute on that vision or I like being able to like drive myself. So I guess <laughs> a safe space to be in that position. Yeah. I'll add one more thing that I found to be really interesting. I feel like I've gone through this multiple times and every time I learn it again and again, is it's just so interesting to see how when you build your own startup, your own thing that, you know, you're creating something out of nothing, people might tell you that, hey, it's a good idea what you're building, or they might give you like little bits of feedback and validation, but no one really says like, you're on the right track. Like, you know, you're definitely doing the right thing with your time today, especially if you don't raise money. Like I think for a lot of startups, when they raise money, that's their first validation point. Like, oh, somebody thinks that I'm qualified to run this. Like, it's almost like giving you a high five. Like you can do this, you know, I believe in you. But when you're building on your own, especially when you're bootstrapping, you don't really have anyone to say that to you. And I mean, my husband said that to me all the time, which is lovely. It's great support, but it's not like I have a boss or a company was saying to me, you're on the right track. And a couple of weeks ago, we had a feature in the New York Times, which is awesome, especially a couple weeks after launch. But I was just reflecting on how like the day before the New York Times article, I was doing the exact same thing as the day after the New York Times article. We were still building in the same direction, but we had that external validation of someone saying, oh, what you're doing is meaningful enough that I'm going to cover it and tell a lot of people about it. And that was really interesting because like suddenly people say, oh, you know, what you're doing is you are building something meaningful. But I think until you have that validation, it's like you almost have to convince yourself of it every day. And I think that's one of the hardest parts about working on your own. Oh, absolutely. And I think to build off that, I mean, in a way, we've probably gotten pretty used to 
finding validation through so many different outlets. I mean, I guess if you look at the entirety of social media, that's built up with an engine of validation. So in our daily lives, we can get validated in small ways. And I think that's what makes going out and setting out and doing what you're doing scary because it's like, you know, you already pointed out, there's not as many set up structures to find that. And I think a lot of us probably all struggle with being our best cheerleader nowadays when, you know, if we need a boost, we need a hit, we can always maybe turn to our expected structures, social media or our boss or whatever, and just make sure, am I doing this right? Am I on the right path? Is this okay? So I just more or less, I think it's just admirable. I think going out and being like, all right, no one is going to be here to cheer me on yet. So I've got to figure out how to do that myself. And oh yeah, successfully build this thing. (laughs) No small Mm. feat. Yeah. It's fun though, because you get to do whatever you want. (laughs) Exactly. No, no. I think that's amazing. I think that's a beautiful part of what you're doing. I think one thing I really love just like walking through your content and everything you've built so far, it's certainly an impressive amount in your first like five weeks of launch is like, you know, you're so story driven. I can clearly tell that, you know, you come from that journalist background and you know how to dig in and get the right stories from people. And so I was wondering, you know, in these early time period, are you already seeing, you know, common trends or patterns amongst the stories you're covering that maybe like give you a little bit of new insight to what startup success might look like? Yeah, I do think we're like pretty early to see a lot of trends, but this is one of the things I'm really excited about because even for me, just reviewing all the stories on the site, like I'm already starting to pull out trends, even in the, you know, small number of ones that we've published so far. So I think once we have, like we have about 900 deals in our database already, but we have to go through them and put them into context. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I think that's one of the most interesting parts about this. And I can share a couple of little things that I've noticed that have been really interesting to me. For example, one is how the different sellers found their buyer, because I think there's a lot of routes that we all know of. Like there are plenty of first time sellers who get approached by someone when they're not expecting or not looking forward to selling necessarily. And then there's lots of options, like, as you know, marketplaces, there's brokers. But one way that some people have sold that we've written about so far is by cold pitching their buyer. And I thought that was really cool. Like I hadn't personally really thought about that as an avenue that you could, hey, let me identify, you know, who are these most likely acquirers who would get some strategic value out of my company and just go directly to them and pitch them myself. And I think that's been really cool. So I look forward to reviewing more of those and hopefully we can come up with some resources that will help other people follow that same path if they want to. But that's been one of the most interesting things for me. And honestly, like I'm not an expert in M&A. Like I'm a target demographic because I've gone through this. But for me, one of the best parts about this is I get to learn about this topic as we figure out how to cover it. So I'm having to surround myself by with experts that do know M&A really well. You know, I'm an expert in building a media company. So if I can bring them in to help with the topical expertise, then we can create something really valuable. But yeah, so far, that's one kind of little tidbit that I've noticed that I thought was really interesting. I think that that is a fascinating approach. And I love that you're looking at that and going, okay, well, you know, we've got enough of this coming through and it's showing to be a tactic. Like, how do we enable people and show them how to do it. You know, that's the next step. It's more than just covering the stories. It's like, let me show you how it's done or, Mm -hmm. you know, advise you, which I think is amazing that you're kind of more holistic, I suppose, in your approach. Yeah. I could think of one other thing that might be useful for your audience, which is we've noticed already a few sellers who didn't know that they could sell their company and ended up going on to do it. So they had an asset or like, you know, a business that they were planning to wind down because they didn't want to run it anymore. And for some reason or another, they got wind of, oh, someone mentioned, oh, maybe you could sell it. And they started exploring down that path and realized, oh yeah, I actually have something sellable here. And and then they brought home a good chunk of money for it. So that's been really interesting to me that there's people out there who have businesses that they may just want to let die or wind down because they're not interested anymore or something else comes up in their life that means they won't be able to run it anymore. And thinking about, you know, could I sell this business or could I sell part of this business so that I have, can take home some meaningful, a chunk of change from it. Yeah. You know, it is crazy because I guess, again, at this point, I'm like, I take it for granted. It's like, oh, don't you know? And it's like, no, many people don't know. (laughs) I mean, I remember interviewing one seller and 
you know, he ended up being like in a, a case study of ours. And so obviously his sale went really well. And he was just like, I thought my only option was just like driving this thing into the ground, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, as the only way to get rid of it. I didn't know what to do. I was going to, you know, destroy my inventory. And then, you know, some light at the end of the tunnel somehow found a way to not have to go through that. And then he was like, oh my gosh. And it is incredible how many people like don't know. I think it's the thing you get into an entrepreneurship and you're like, well, I set out to be an entrepreneur and run a successful business. Full stop. There wasn't any kind of comma to sell. (laughs) So, you know, of course, it's interesting that you're already running into that. And I mean, this kind of comes to mind as you're digging into these stories. What about digging into these acquisition stories within the online space in particular, I think just kind of like really stands out to you. Like, do you find that there's kind of like an interesting angle, an interesting buzz, something that people just like don't even know or understand about this industry that I think really pulls you along to gather these stories? I mean, the thing that's always magnetic for me is just so you can create something out of nothing. You know, Mm -hmm. how did these people come up with the idea? How did they build it? How did they you know, day over day, week over week, month over month, year over year, build it to a point where it was worth something to somebody else. Like pretty much all these people started something from nothing. That's the part that I always think is so cool about because online business, it's like when you're doing something online, I find there are just fewer barriers than to me in my brain anyways, than if you were doing something in person or in brick and mortar. Absolutely. There's so many tools and you can figure out how to do anything. So as long as you're willing to put that time in to figure it out, that's what I think is like the part that for me feels like really magical about starting and eventually selling an online business. Yeah. I feel like it's more of a, it's almost like a a democratic version of entrepreneurship. Like, you know, everyone can kind of get a shot as long Mm -hmm. as you have that, the Wi-Fi or a little bit of cash or like a really fantastic idea, a little bit of know-how. Yeah. Like you said, that's the magnetism of it. There's the beauty of it. And I think being able to be rooted in telling stories in that corner of M&A, it's got to be a lot of fun. You know, you were saying earlier, I know that your experiences in building content and I just wanted to like make sure I didn't walk away from that because I think that you offer so much knowledge in that facet. And there's so many people who would like, they would love to build a media brand. But, you know, as someone who's been in the field for a while, you've probably seen people make mistakes or entrepreneurs do things wrong when they're trying to build out content for their site. So I was wondering if you kind of had any word of advice or things that you see went wrong and you could steer people around, what would that be? The place that I always start from is creating really high quality content. And that's from my background as journalist. And sometimes it comes back to bite me because sometimes I'm like, I want this to be, you know, I try to get every piece to be a really high standard. And, you know, sometimes that isn't, well, I think of it as the baseline for all of my brands, but I think it's possible to go overboard (laughs) with it. Like I see some folks running content sites who are more focused on other pieces and, you know, maybe their content isn't at the level where I would want it to be for my own site, but they still are killing it. You know, they're doing a great job and they're building something that people really respect and that's valuable to people. But for me, I like generally, I always think about coming at it from how can you create something that's valuable? Because if people don't want to read it or listen to it or consume it, then you're not really doing yourself or them a favor. I appreciate that perspective. Yeah. I was talking to someone recently and they were talking about like trying to make people's lives a millimeter better. I was a parent who was just on her podcast recently released. And I really like that because even in the content space or the affiliate space, it's like you get a lot of people who set out to make money, period. Not necessarily mm-hmm. like add value to my reader, period. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they can be different things, even though they're meant to be interrelated. So I think it's a good reminder for people to keep that into perspective. Yeah. I think one challenge, I guess I would add with content businesses can be that when you think about like, how do you add value and how do you make money relating to what you just said? Like for a lot of businesses, content helps to grow the business, but it's not what you're actually selling. So I think of content businesses as sometimes two different types of businesses. One is like the content is the product and that's what people are paying for. And that's how you're making your money versus a business where content might even be at the forefront, but you make your money in a different way, or it's like you make your money adjacent to it, or maybe the content marketing is supporting the business as a whole and it's bringing people in the door. So it's moving the business forward, but it's not directly making money for the business. And I think the way to think about those, how you think about your business can differ depending on which of those two buckets you fall in. 
No, absolutely. Well, I mean, I guess a little bit related to that. I know a part of building your businesses, just kind of reading through some of the things that you've done in the past and what you mentioned as a priority was, you know, creating efficiencies. And I imagine now that you're working on your own, creating efficiencies is probably pretty important. Do you have any favorite, I guess, efficiency systems, productivity hacks, things that you find that really just maximize your ROI? My brain kind of works in this way. I don't know if there's like one thing that I do, <laughs> but just generally making sure that everything has a process for it. So that I partly so I could hand it off to someone else if I have the opportunity to do so. But I find this to be really challenging in the early days. Like it's almost like I get ahead of myself because I know that I need to have a process for things, but we also may not have figured out how to do that thing yet. So right. you almost have to like allow it to be messy in the early days and work through it so that you can figure out what is the process. You can't document the process until you figure it out what it looks like. So yeah, I think thinking ahead in that way is helpful and that it can make the business more efficient and it does make it easier to hire other people and onboard them. But I also find sometimes I get ahead of myself, which isn't helpful in the early days. Yeah. The struggle of a blank canvas. I mean, <laughs> how can you, how can you build out the SOP for the thing that's completely, it needs to be built first. Exactly. It's tough. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. tough. I mean, I, even just in my time, you know, working with a team, like, you know, the question is, where's the SOP for that? It's like, well, we're still building that. We're still figuring out that thing. That person is new. You know, we're working it out and surely you get everything constructed over time, but it certainly is a process. Yeah. You really need to have people who are willing to work through that with you. And also who are willing to pitch in to make the process better because 100%. I find sometimes, yeah, if, if you get the wrong freelancer who's expecting this process to to stay the same. And then, you know, I end up changing it a lot. I, I try to set that expectation up front, like, hey, we're a startup, things are not set up in stone, you know, this is going to change a lot. And we'd love for you to help us change it to make it better. I love that. Yeah. I like that expectation. And it's kind of like, it's good that you at least set that ground, at least at the front, because I mean, it's like, I think I asked you before the interview, I was like, you cool if we, you know, talk off the cuff, you want to stick to the script? And you're like, no, cool with that. Like, let's go. But you'd be surprised how important that question is. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, everybody has a different way of doing things and that's totally fine. But I think that's a super valuable tidbit for all those people out there. We get a lot of people who talk about what it's like to build writing teams and the struggle of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm very it's hungry hard. for that. Yeah. <laughs> How do I do it? How do I find the right person? Uh, can I just, you know, put them into my system? It'll be fine. It's like, no, it's, there's more nuance than that. I guess switching gears a little bit, you know, one thing you mentioned just earlier on, and we, you know, you and I were talking about offline is, you know, you have a passion for helping women advance and key positions of leadership and kind of be seen in this acquisition space. And so what is the inspiration behind this motivation? And, you know, how do you go about helping women founders? I want to see more women in power and in leadership roles. It's pretty simple. So to do that, I think we all have to help each other. And so I just look for opportunities to help other women who have a question you know, I'm always trying to protect my time. And sometimes my inclination is to say, no, I might say, wait a minute, is there one little thing I can do to help this person that's going to like help them move forward, you know, and giving a little bit of my time might help them tremendously. So I push myself to do that a little bit. Even outside of that, I really think about how do I lift up other women in my work? So when I was trying to decide what my next company would be, I thought about this a lot because I thought about like, do I want to do something that directly impacts women leaders. And for me, that didn't quite feel right, but I consider it to be like in the background of what I'm building now. So I'm building this media company and by, and by no means are we saying like, we don't say on the front page, hey, we're looking to feature women. But my personal goal by doing this is that along with lifting up all founders, we're also going to find ways to highlight underrepresented founders. And for me, I think that's the best way that I can make an impact is I want to create something that's for everybody. I don't really want to create something that's just for women, but I think by creating something that's for everybody and including women in it, I can help them find a place at the table. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's just meaningful to have you have that in mind. Cause it was like, that was a thing I think I found coming to industry you know, as an outsider early on from first impression, I almost thought like, where are the women or mm -hmm. am I kind of alone coming into this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the more and more I've been in the industry, I'm like, no, there's amazing people. There's amazing women on our marketplace. There's amazing experts in the industry. Like everyone's there. We just need to make sure that everyone's gotten an invitation to the party, that they're being seen, that we know that. So it doesn't feel so 
so siloed because it is, mm-hmm. it's easy to get siloed and think that there's a couple key experts that represent the industry at large, and that's just not the case. There's a lot of people to learn from. Yeah, I bet you're really well connected. So if there are people you think I should meet, let me know. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited to, you know, hopefully show you some cool stories on our end. I think you're an excellent storyteller over there. It just a more or less like getting towards the end of the interview here. What are your goals for the future of They Got Acquired? I want us to become the place where any founder who wants to sell their company is going to go to learn about the process and also figure out how are they going to sell their own company. So whether that's helping them connect to the right lawyer or the right M&A professional or the marketplace, whether that's helping them get a hold of the data that they need to make a decision on how they should value their own company. I want them to think of us when they hit that inflection point and hopefully well before that too, because you know, years before you actually sell, you can start doing things to position yourself to sell, you know, and to get as much as you can out of your company. So I want to help people do that even from the years, you know, ahead of when they're actually at their inflection point. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm so stoked. I mean, probably as you can tell, you know, fangirling over here, not quietly about what you're building. So, I mean, it's been wonderful to have you on, to hear more about it. I think there's probably a lot of people out there excited, like I've got a really cool story. I want to be featured in this. I've got something to share. So yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait for everyone to kind of get in and jump in on this. Thanks. Yeah. I have just like a couple rapid fire questions for you. A little tradition of the show. If you're cool with that, I can kick the first one off. Mm -hmm. Go for it. All right. So in your take, what are the best hidden growth opportunities with an online business? I'm really excited about advertising in smaller newsletters that are by individual creators. So I don't know yet. I can say that this works because I we're just in the early stages of trying it, but it's something I'm excited about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're really excited about the newsletter space in general. It's been really fun as we've launched a new revamped newsletter in the past few months and realizing, oh my gosh, it's really cool stuff out there. Cool. So what tools or resources can people use to help optimize their content marketing? One of my favorites right now is Typefully. It's a tool you can use to make Twitter threads. Cool. Yeah. It helps you just kind of see, you know, when you're laying out a thread, often we'll use it. If we have a post that we want to turn into a Twitter thread, we'll put it in there and it lets you make sure you you don't have too many characters and you can make it look formatted the way you want. But that's one of the tools that we're using now. Ooh, I like that one. That's a good one. Awesome. And final, sometimes the hardest question, what has been your funniest moment working within the world of online business? I don't know if I have a funny moment, but I can tell you a meaningful moment or something that's interesting that most people don't have. I met my husband on Twitter about 10 years ago, and I would never have met him if I hadn't been using Twitter for business. Wow. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. That is so awesome. Just, I don't know, conversation. Like, (laughs) I like this person. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Wow. Very awesome. Well, I appreciate you kind of coming on, sharing all your stories. I know we like kind of, you were very gracious that I kind of grilled you with a lot of things that came off the top of my head. So thank you for letting me just dig into everything with you today. Yeah. Thanks for asking interesting questions. Thank you. Well, good luck with everything. And where can people find you if they want to connect with you? Yes. Come to theygotacquired.com slash newsletter. That's where you can sign up for our newsletter. And we're just launching a podcast too. So look for They Got Acquired wherever you listen to podcasts. And I'm on Twitter. If you want to personally connect with me, I'm on Twitter at Alexis Grant. Awesome. Well, I will add some links to the show notes and looking forward to seeing people connect with you and find you in the future. You're doing exciting things. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've walked away with a bit of new insight that'll help you in your digital entrepreneurship journey. If you enjoy this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating review. To learn more about businesses available for sale at Empire Flippers, click the link in the description or visit empireflippers.com slash marketplace. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.